series uh, that we've been in is about the parables of Jesus. Uh, if you're joining us, we've been going over for about a month now. Uh, just about the various parables in the Gospels, where Jesus tells stories, if you will, that have a point. He tries to convey different kind of uh, points, right? He's trying to convey different important things about greater realities. Uh, we're currently talking about the kingdom of heaven. And if you think about any of these parables that Jesus says about the kingdom of heaven, you can't just look at one and think that's the whole picture. Uh, what you really need to do to, to understand the fullness of what Jesus is talking about is to really consider all of the parables that talk about the kingdom of heaven to get a bigger, fuller picture of, of what he's talking about. And today we're going to be talking about two of those parables. Uh, we're going to be talking about the value of the kingdom of heaven as we read Matthew 13. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there. It's only three verses, Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46, and we'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And out of reverence for God's word, uh, if you're able, please stand as we hear God speak to us through his word. Again, this is Matthew 13. Verses 44 through 46. This is God's word. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, as we hear Jesus speaking not only to the people then, but Lord, through your Spirit speaking to us today, Lord God, we need ears to hear. Lord, it's something that Jesus says over and over. Lord, we need ears to hear. Uh, we need hearts that can be good soil, Lord God, to receive your word. Uh, and so, Lord God, make this that time where we're able to hear, where we're able to believe. Lord God, where we're able to, to get a glimpse into what Jesus is talking about concerning the kingdom of heaven. And so, Lord God, with great anticipation and expectation. Lord God, won't you speak to us at this time? And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure. It's like hidden treasure. It's like finding the pearl of all pearls, a pearl of great value. You know, if we think about this parable, the way that we want to kind of unpack this together today is uh, to talk about how the kingdom of heaven is the prize. We want to talk about how it's a prize. We want to talk about, secondly, about the pursuit. Uh, and we'll see that in, in both parables, and you've already, we've read that, about what does that look like to then pursue the kingdom of heaven? If it is a prize, uh, where's the power? How can we live that sort of life, the kind of life that we're reading about as we see the man and the merchant in the parables? And so the prize, uh, the pursuit, the power, we want to consider uh, these three things. If you think about both parables, uh, there's a man in one, and there's a merchant in the second one, and you realize that they both discover the kingdom of heaven. It's something that they did not have. Uh, it's something that they had to discover. And, you know, it begs the question, you know, do you know treasure when you see it? Right? Do, you, do you know what's valuable when you see it? You see a pearl, do you know the value of it? You know, tragically, we can miss even the value of the kingdom of heaven for different reasons. I think for some, when you think about the kingdom of heaven, uh, you think of it as being less than what you think you currently have. You can think of it as being less than what you could attain or, or, or get in this lifetime on your own. Uh, you can think of it as being less than the other treasures and pearls uh, 
uh, that you might be able to find in the world. You know, it makes me think about the rich young ruler right in the Gospels. He had his youth. He has wealth. He has many possessions, it says in the Bible. And he comes to Jesus, right? He comes to Jesus, and he wants to know about eternal life. And he wants to know, you know, good teacher, tell me the way. And Jesus essentially tells him, you know, give up your kingdom and join mine. Come and follow me, right? He's like, give up your kingdom. Give up everything that you've been working for, that you've been living for. You have all this money. Uh, You're living your life a certain way, and Jesus really challenges him, right, and even invites him, give up your kingdom to become a part of mine. Come follow me. That rich young ruler in the Bible, what does he do? Deal or no deal? He's like, no deal. And he walks away sorrowful. For someone like the rich young ruler, what he felt like he had was greater than what Jesus had to offer. Uh, what he had, or what the kingdom of heaven, whatever was being offered, he could, felt like it was less than. That's one of the reasons why people can miss the kingdom of heaven. But people can also miss the kingdom of heaven by making what you have equal to the kingdom of heaven. It's not just saying, you know, what you have being greater than. Or conversely, you know, what the kingdom of heaven is, is less than what's out there. But even if you make it equal to the other treasures and pearls that you think you can find in this world, you can totally miss the value of the kingdom of heaven. You know, like recently I've been watching more WNBA, more than I've ever seen before, more college women's basketball than I've ever had my whole life. Um, I love playing basketball, and I'm trying to transfer that passion to my girls. I'm not sure how that's going. Um, But I've been watching more just women's basketball in general. Uh, I don't know if you know the name Caitlin Clark, if that means anything to you. You know, watching her play, you know, scoring the most points in the history of, you know, NCAA Division I uh, women's basketball. She was almost like the unanimous, she was going to be the unanimous number one draft pick. She's someone that was seen to be so valuable, life-changing, game-changing kind of a person. Can you imagine if Indiana Fever, who ended up picking her, if they call her and they're, and they're like, you know, we know you're like one of the best players ever, but you know, we're actually considering this other person too. Uh, so just hold on tight. Like if, if you got that call and you're supposed to be the best and the greatest, if you're compared to and, and another person is made equal to you, that devalues you in one sense, right? If you think about even being married and you have a spouse, your spouse is supposed to be the treasure above all other treasures and women or husbands in the world, right? You can't put other people equal to uh, your spouse, even if they are part of BTS, Right? Even when we make things equal to the kingdom of heaven, we totally devalue and we can miss what the kingdom of heaven is really about. I mean, Jesus himself warns, right? You can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't even put things equal to the kingdom of heaven. And this is a sobering question for us to think about because Jesus here is saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. Is it like a hidden treasure that you've discovered? Is that what the kingdom of heaven is to you? Is it like, you, like a merchant who's searching for fine pearls and he finds the one pearl of great value? Is this what the kingdom of heaven is like for you? You know, if you're saying, I'm not sure, consider what Jesus says to Nicodemus. Consider what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3, because maybe you're asking yourself, you're telling me this is supposed to be the greatest thing ever. I'm not sure if I believe it. What Jesus tells Nicodemus is, is this in John 3, 5. He says, truly, truly, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you realize that even being able to see the kingdom of heaven as hidden treasure even being able to see the kingdom of heaven as being the one pearl of great value, do you realize you need to be born again to be able to see that? 
that God needs to give you his spirit to be able to open your eyes to actually see it for what it is? And so one of the sobering questions is if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know if I've ever thought of the kingdom of heaven in this way. Maybe you've been to church for many, many years, but you've never seen the kingdom of heaven, what Jesus is offering, what God is saying as treasure and, and a pearl of great value. One of the questions maybe is, as Jesus says, is, wait, are we, am I born again? Do I have spiritual eyes to see? Maybe if you're not seeing it, maybe there's other alternative treasures or pearls that's really captivating your heart. Maybe there's competing treasures and pearls. Maybe you are someone who is born again, but maybe you're living your life day to day and you're thinking, okay, this is supposed to be the prize. This is supposed to be the thing that, that Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, like hidden treasure, like pearls. And you're like, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm struggling to really to see that, to believe that. And a follow-up question might be, are there competing treasures and pearls in your heart? Because right? Jesus will also say in Matthew 6, he says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That your heart follows what you value. Your heart will follow what you consider to be treasure. You will organize your life around what you believe is treasure. What you value and what is that, right? And, and perhaps there are competing treasures in your heart. Maybe it is career related, right? Either starting your career or maybe getting to a certain place in your career. So much of your life and your thinking is about organizing your life around that. And so the kingdom of heaven seems to pale, right, compared to what you really treasure. And some of us may struggle in that way. Uh, for some of us, maybe it's even things like being liked, right, being accepted. Like that's really your treasure in your heart. So wherever you go, it's not really about what Jesus says or what the Bible says about this or that. It's just really like you're just looking around. It's like, oh, do I fit in? Is this person going to like me? Am I going to be accepted over here in this group? And sometimes that could be the treasure, right, that we're really seeking. It's something to ask yourself, right? And even for many of the parents who are here, you know, your child's future. Is that the treasure? Is that the pearl of all the great pearls that we really want to see realized and fulfilled, right, in our lives? And are we really organizing our lives, our time around that? What is the treasure? What is the pearl? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is, right? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is the hidden treasure, the pearl of great value. And you realize when Jesus says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like, how should you then respond? What's the pursuit? And if you think about the parable, the man and the merchant, they don't defer their pursuit until a later time, right? They don't say, oh, let me just get through this season and then I'll come back to this six months from now. It's still going to be there. The hidden treasure is still going to be there. I'll come back a year from now. Uh, when things over here settle down or when I get to my goal over here, then, then I'll come back and pursue. Uh, no, you don't see that. You see Jesus saying, if, if the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure, a pearl of great value, they sell immediate, immediately, right, all that they have so that they can get it. They sell all that they have so that they can get it. And you realize even as, as this parable unfolds in this way, you know, Christianity, what Jesus is saying is, is like it's not about asceticism where it's about, you know, self-denial. It's all about abstinence and your focus is just on what you're giving up, right? Jesus is not saying that's what he's proposing, He's saying you're giving up so that you can get something better. You're going after something better than what you think you currently have. Right? We're not talking about asceticism. So what does it mean? Right? You're saying you get the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to sell all that you have right in this parable? Are we talking about emptying your bank account, selling all of your stocks, your assets, and you know, giving it to the church? I don't think he's literally talking about doing that. God may call some people to do that, but I don't think he's literally talking. But this is what it's supposed to look like for everybody. But what it does mean is it means it's giving up the right to be the king of your kingdom in order for you to be a citizen of his. 
if you think about this man and the merchant, giving up all that they have, selling all that they have so that they can get the kingdom of heaven, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great value. What it does mean, it means that you're giving up the right to be the king of your kingdom, whatever that looks like for you. Giving up that right in order to be a citizen in God's kingdom. It means organizing your life around what you now deem to be the treasure in your life. It means organizing your life around an all-important new center in your life, the kingdom of heaven. And just to unpack even what that looks like, think about someone like Zacchaeus in the Bible. Right? Think about someone like Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? A wee little man was he. I think the song should also add that he was a rich tax collector, you know? Zacchaeus was a rich little man, right? A rich little man was he? He was rich. You know, unjust gain, he was rich. But you think about him being in a tree, Jesus calls him down. And Jesus basically opens his eyes to the kingdom of heaven, right? Spends dinner with him. How does Zacchaeus respond? It's not like, let me just become poor now. No, but he has a new all-important center, doesn't he? He organizes his life in a very different way because what he wants to do after his eyes are opened is he wants to generously give to the poor. You see what he's doing with his wealth. With what God has given him, now there's a new center. He's organizing his life, having his wealth in a different way. He gives generously to the poor. He even wants to make recompense, right, and restitution for all those people that he's wronged. He wants to pay them back with interest. Here is someone who has wealth, eyes are opened up to the kingdom of heaven, and now he organizes, organizes his life with his wealth in a different way. It means that you're using whatever God has given you. Maybe it's wealth, or maybe it's your network. Maybe it's even your personality. It's reorganizing what God has given you to serve as a means to a greater end. It's no longer simply about using what God has given you to basically improve your own life, to simply hoard blessings for yourselves. It now means using what God has given you to actually be a blessing to others, to actually lift others up. Think about even your time. Like, what does it look like for your time to get reorganized if you're wanting to have a kingdom mindset, right? Sometimes you think about the way we use our time. If it's simply about you being the king of your kingdom, you'll spend most of your time just playing video games, just watching things, doing whatever you think will make you happy with your time. But what would it look like if now you have a new all-important center where even how you use your time is being reorganized, right? I mean, you, you're using your time to actually encourage those who are down. You're wanting to use your time to now serve others. You're wanting to use your time to comfort those who are going through affliction and suffering. Even how you use your time and how you use your schedule, it, it gets reorganized in very drastic sort of ways. And even those with children, it's so easy for your children to become the treasure where your whole life is organized around your children. You know what our children need is not to hear just me simply talking about this or even to hear you simply just talking about this. Our children actually need to see their parents organizing their life around the kingdom of heaven. We need to show them what that actually looks like. It's not enough simply to just talk or teach about it. Our children need to see what it looks like to follow Jesus in this way. Are we living as the king of our own kingdoms? Or are we living as citizens in God's? Now, what is your life organized around? If we took a closer look at your life right now, in addition to whatever you profess, what would be at the center? Right? What would be at the center of that? 
I think the tragic irony for some, if not many of us, is in our heads we know, we know this. We know, okay, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be like our greatest treasure. Yeah, like I understand that. Uh, I, I, want, I believe that in my head. You know, we're trying to say that there's all these other fine pearls out there in the world, but this is the one of greatest value. In our heads, we know it, but do we sometimes struggle to live that out? If you're like me, the answer is yes, right? It's not enough to simply know it. Sometimes in our own hearts, we lack the power to be able to live this out. And this is where in that first parable, I think there's such a key word that's mentioned in verse 44, is that as this man finds hidden treasure, it says that in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It says in his joy, not out of duty and obligation, uh, not because he's worried about what other people might think or what he's supposed to do. It says in his joy. The question is, how can we have that joy? Because that's where the power comes from. How can you have joy to be in a place where you are convicted to use all that God has given you and saying, you know what, I want to use this as a means for God's kingdom, not simply for my own. What's going to compel you to do that? There's something about this man doing it in his joy. It's a question for us all to wrestle with. In your joy, are you in a place where you're like, God, this is yours. Let me, let me see how I can reorganize and, and, and do this with a new, all-important center in my life. Do you have that kind of joy that compels you? And how can we get it? I was reminded of a childhood movie that I watched so many times growing up. It was during a time when we would record movies that are playing on TV by recording it on a VHS. I don't know if any of you guys grew up with that. Uh, parents didn't buy us like actual legitimate like movies and VHS tapes, so we would just illegally record all the ones on TV and rewatch those with all the commercials and everything. There was one particular movie that, among many others, that we would watch over and over again, and one of them was Hook, the Peter Pan movie with Robin Williams. He's Peter Pan, Julia Roberts is Tinkerbell. I don't know if you guys watched that movie. I think I looked it up, and I was like, oh, like it's in the early 90s. Like, oh, okay, that's, that was a while ago. <laughs> but I was watching that movie, and there's this one particular scene where Peter's an adult. Peter Pan is an adult. Uh, he's a grown-up. He's lost his imagination, right, because he's in the real world now. Uh, he's brought back to Neverland, and he's at this, like, dinner scene with the lost boys. You guys know what I'm talking about, the scene? Um, here he is as a grown-up, and, you know, the plates and the platters all come out, and all the lost boys, everyone starts, like, eating voraciously, right? There's steam coming off these empty-looking plates and bowls and platters, and they're, like, eating like it's a feast, this is where I realized, like, you know, how the creators of these movies, they, they throw in these nuggets for the adults who are watching, you know, because I was re-watching the scene, I was like, oh, this is totally for adults, like, that one line. You know, and, and Robin Williams is looking around, you know, as Peter Pan, he's like, dude, like, there's no food, right, because Tinkerbell is like, eat, and he's like, there's no food. It's like, Gandhi ate more than this, <laughs> right? He's like, I want real food. And here's Robin Williams looking at it, and it's like, the way that the scene unfolds is once he starts using his imagination, the feast appears before, he's, before his eyes. Uh, it's when he uses his imagination that he could really enjoy what's in front of him. I think for, for many people, when you think about finding joy in the kingdom of heaven, it's kind of like that. We think like we have to use our imagination to really find that joy. I think for some Christians, you think like you just have to try really hard and imagine that this, this really is the greatest treasure for me. You know, let me just use my imagination to really believe it and try to live this out. But do you realize that as Christians, you don't need just more of your imagination. There needs to be a person. There needs to be a person for whom you are giving things up for. There needs to be a person for whom you are now trying to live for. It's not simply enough to be like, I just need to give things up and, and reorganize things in my life because I'm supposed to. That's not good enough. That's actually not even Christianity. 
We're giving things up, wanting to reorganize things in our lives for a person. And, and that's what even Paul captures in Philippians 3, right? Like he gets it. And in Philippians 3, 7 through 8, he says, whatever gain I had, I'd count it as a loss, right? He says, whatever gain I had, I'd count it as loss for the sake of Christ. It's for the sake of Christ. There's a person there. I count everything as loss. Again, compared to the treasure, compared to the one pearl of great value. I consider everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of what? Having less? Because of the surpassing worth, Paul says, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. There's a person there for Paul. He's wanting to know more of Jesus. Richard Sibbs, a Puritan, says it this way, that Christ is the great pearl, the peerless pearl. There's no pearl that compares. Incomparable. The peerless pearl. Jesus is the treasure. He is the pearl. And this is where the joy even comes from. He's the one that actually first seeks us out, right? It's not simply that, that he's a treasure over here and it's just all up to us to go and get him. It's just all up to us to go and, and to know him more. No, Jesus is the treasure who first loved us, who sought us, us out, right? He's a treasure, the pearl who actually gave up everything so that he could make us his own. In this way, Jesus is the one who makes it a joy for us to now give up everything that we have and be like, God, won't you use it? I want to be a citizen of your kingdom. I am following someone who was willing to give up his life for me. You know, today, if, you, if you've come here and we think about the man and the merchant and the parable, perhaps you've stumbled in here today. Uh, the, man, the man in the parable, he wasn't looking for hidden treasure. He stumbled upon it. Maybe some of us who are here today, you've been searching for fine pearls in, in many different places in your life. You've been trying to find meaning and treasure in, in this area or in doing this. And maybe you've been searching for a while. Jesus is telling you today that the kingdom of heaven is what you're looking for. Jesus is, is who you're looking for. It's not going to be about being in a different city, about being in a better job, being with a different kind of person. Jesus is the one that you're looking for. And for those of us who have been trying to live the Christian life, I mean, later even when we do the Lord's Supper, our response need to be, needs to be where we repent over the competing treasures and pearls in our hearts. It's not just a matter of, I need to be better. It's, we'll have an opportunity to repent over the competing treasures and pearls. But it's really a time to really believe in, like, is there Jesus in my Christian life? It feels weird to say that. But do you have a Christless Christianity? Like when you read the Bible, are you reading the Bible just to read the Bible? Or is there a sense where there's, there's Jesus there, where you're wanting to know Jesus more? You know, when you're praying, are you going through the motions of just basically having a cathartic experience of just sharing and saying things out loud? Or, or is there a person with whom you're talking and praying to? In your serving, in our pursuit of excellence, like is it about the excellence or is it for someone? Right? Is there a person there? You know, God, he's so good because he not only gives us the truth, he gives us his son and even through his son, he gives us his spirit. His spirit who bears the fruit of joy, even as we strive to live for him. My hope and prayer is that we can echo, along with Paul, where he says in places like Galatians 2.20, that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, right? But you can even say, I joyfully live. That we can do that with joy that we joyfully live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That'd be my prayer for me. That'd be my prayer for you. That's my prayer for us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, and 
Some of us need our eyes open, Lord God, where we need to be born again to be able to see the things that Jesus sees. Lord God, for some of us, Lord, there are competing treasures and pearls, Lord God, that we go back and forth to. There are things that we do, just even in our Christian life, Lord God, where we are lacking joy. And Lord, we come before you knowing that we can't generate this sort of joy on our own. Lord God, we can't li keep living the Christian life, Lord God, as the king of our own kingdoms. But Lord God, won't you show us, Lord, how we can live as citizens of yours. Lord, won't you through your spirit really stir up our hearts so that we might not only see, but Lord, really have the joy that you have made possible as we strive to live for you, as we strive and really desire to make you our treasure. And so, Lord, won't you do this work, not only in our minds, but also in our hearts, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.